inner products are mathematical objects that allow us to talk about angles and projections and do geometry um, without uh, too much difficulty. So the one that you're already familiar with is in Rn, where it goes by the common name of the dot product. And so if you have two vectors, u and v, the dot product of them is defined by, you take the kth coordinate of u and the kth coordinate of v, and then you add them all up. Right? Um, now you may have also seen something about how you take the uh, product of the magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between them. And maybe that was given to you as the definition, or maybe the one I just said first is the definition, and that one was the theorem. Either one, they're equivalent. But we are going to um, not go with that formulation in this class because it doesn't generalize well to other contexts. Um, what we want to do is we want to generalize this notion to other vector spaces where it is called an inner product. And instead of uh, writing u dot v, typically uh, it's written instead as uh, uv in angle brackets. And so an inner product is a mapping or a function. And it takes a pair of elements of a vector space. So it's a function from v cross v, so pairs of elements of v. And it spits out a complex number. And we usually denote it, like I said, with the inner product here. So the idea is that this is going to be some kind of number, a scalar. And it has to satisfy the following properties. It needs to be the case that uh, if you switch the order of these things, then you get the same thing. Or if it's complex valued, you get the conjugate of the thing you started with. It also needs to be the case that it's linear. So if you do the inner product of u with a linear combination, of vectors, then this needs to be a u v plus b u w. So you can break the sum and and pull out the constants. And then um, in view of the uh, the first one that says you can flip things around, uh, you can also pull linear combinations out of the um, uh, the first slot as well. However, because of the conjugate here, you should notice that if you take a u v and you pull out the a, it comes with a conjugate. Now most of the stuff we'll be doing is real valued, so you don't actually need to worry about it. Uh, but for Fourier transform, there are things in the integrals that have uh, complex numbers, so we will need to actually worry a little bit about uh, the, the conjugates. But don't worry, there won't be too much of it. The last thing that it requires, so we've got um, let me actually let me just write down the, the names for these. So so this is uh, called symmetry or or um, conjugate symmetry, and then this one is linearity. Or uh, since it's linear in each slot, bilinearity, and then this last one is called the positive definite property. And it requires that um, the inner product of anything with itself is non-negative. That's the positive part. And then the definite part is that uh, if you get 0, this happens only for the 0 vector. So it gives you a way to sort of identify 0. OK, so what do we do with an inner product? Why do we care about them? Well, it allows you to talk about a bunch of very useful concepts in a vector space. So for example, it gives you an idea of what orthogonality means. Orthogonality is defined by saying that the two things have an inner product of 0. Um, it gives you a way to talk about projections. So the projection of v onto u is defined to be whoops, the inner product of v against u divided by the inner product of u against itself times u. In the case when 
u is a unit vector, so if it has length 1, then this just looks like vu times u. And so that's when um, u has norm 1, or, or length 1. Uh, speaking of which, that's another thing that the inner product gives you. Norm, or length. So you can define a norm by saying that the norm of u, or the length of u, or the magnitude of u, these are all synonyms is the square root of the inner product of the thing with itself. And so, so what is a norm? Well, a norm is also a function. A norm is a function. It takes a single vector, and it spits out a positive real number. And it has some properties of its own. So. It is uh, positive homogeneous, meaning that if you have a scalar multiple of a vector, then you can pull the scalar out in an absolute value. Um, and it um, does not satisfy linearity. But if you have the sum, of, the norm of a sum, this is less than or equal to. So you get an inequality, the sum of the two magnitudes. So this is a super important one. It's called the triangle inequality. Uh, this one is, is uh, positive homogeneity. By the way, all these terms in blue, th these are just for your uh, mathematical edification. I'm never going to test you on them or anything like that. I might refer to them again, but I'm not going to hold you accountable on a test or anything for knowing them. Um, and then it also has its own version of uh, positive definite, which is that the magnitude of a vector cannot be negative, and that the size of a vector is 0, if and only if it's actually the 0 vector. So that's also called positive definiteness. OK, so why do we care about norms? Well. Once you've got a norm, then you also get a notion of distance. So um, in, in a fancy math class, we'd call it a metric. And so that means you can talk now about how far apart x and y are. So the distance from x to y, you can define it as the magnitude of the difference. And we know we can take the difference because we're in a vector space, so we know what the meaning of x minus y is. So the distance from x to y is the length of the gap between them, or the length of the difference of them. All right. And then once you have a notion of distance, then you get a notion of topology. And so a topology is a rule for telling you what sequences converge. In other words, what limits exist. And so we can say now that the limit of a sequence of vectors is x. We define this by pulling it back into what it means for limits to exist in the real numbers by saying, what is the limit of xn minus x? So now, since this here is uh, a real number, in fact, a, a non-negative real number, um, that just takes us back into something we know from regular calculus. And so the upshot of this is that once you have this, we can do calculus. We can do calculus in a vector space. Because, well, if I can spell it, geez, OK, having a rough time with the spelling. I got excited. We can do calculus. Calculus, the thing that makes calculus calculus is limits. All the good stuff about calculus is limits, right? Continuity, uh, integrals, derivatives, infinite series. It's all about things defined in terms of limits. So once you have a topology, um, you can have limits. Now, I should say that you don't need an inner product for, for any of this stuff. But once you have an inner product, then it gives you a norm. And then the norm gives you a topology, a rule for, for limits. And then you have 
calculus and a way to do calculus in your vector space. Okay, now it's possible to just jump in at like some earlier stage, like you can just give some other rule for what it means for limits to converge, or you can define a norm that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with an inner product and go from there and so on and so forth. But inner products have lots of advantages. And, and the key one is that it allows for the possibility of an orthonormal basis. Now we know that the best thing about um, vector spaces is the fact that they have bases and once you have a basis it makes things very easy to describe. An orthonormal basis is even better. So an orthonormal basis is a vector space basis. <coughs> uh, so let's say it's, whoa, let's say it's uh, u sub n. Uh, which has the property that if I look at the inner product between un and um, then this is going to be zero whenever n is not equal to m, and it's going to be one whenever n is equal to m. And so this uh, top property here, this is orthogonality. In other words, different members of the basis are orthogonal. And then uh, this uh, second property here is that they're normalized to have magnitude 1. Because if the inner product of uh, un against un is 1, then, then that is exactly the same as saying that un has magnitude 1, because the square root of 1 is 1. OK. and. The reason why orthonormal bases are lovely is that for a general basis, um, you know that any vector in your vector space, vector space can be written as a sum of the UNs with, with some coefficients. But these guys here can be a bit of a mystery. How do you compute them? Well, you might need to do something with row operations in a finite dimensional case. In an infinite dimensional case, it could be even harder, as infinite dimensions are wont to be. However, for an orthonormal basis, um, you can write v as the sum of, and since you have this notion of orthogonality, you can talk about the projection of v onto un. And if we have an orthonormal basis, then this amounts to being just the, um, the inner product of u, v against the unit vector un times un. And that's the good stuff right here. This is the decomposition of v with respect to an orthonormal basis. And that is one of the most useful tools around.